Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us for our first Juntos Avanzamos webinar of the year, serving refugee communities. Now, my name is Rene Vargas Martinez. I'm director of our Inclusive Puerto Rico Network, and I also work with Paolo de Filippi in the development and expansion of our Juntos Avanzamos program. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Now, before we start, I would like to go ahead and talk about the rules of this webinar. First of all, it is important for all of you to know that this webinar is being recorded for future use and will be shared with those credit units that are part of the inclusive and Juntos San Samos network that were not able to make it this after, with us this afternoon. Also, this is a webinar, but we do want you to participate as much as possible and ask the questions that you need to ask. Now, there are several ways to ask questions. You can do that by just dropping in a question in the chat. I will make sure our panelists see it towards the end of the webinar, or you can also use the Q&A button um, at any time during the presentations. We do encourage you to use those and to participate. Now, having said that, I will go ahead and pass it over to Pablo de Filippi, Inclusive's EVP, Executive Vice, Exclusive Network EVP. Pablo, um, good afternoon. Gracias, René. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us. Um, this is such an important conversation. Uh, you know, we're all glued, glued to the TV, seeing the humanitarian disaster in U Ukraine. And we're going to see, you know, our refugees coming to the US. We have seen it before with Afghanistan. And um, the US has been, you know, for many, <clears throat> many years, a country that welcomes refugees. Uh, mm -hmm. That's been a little bit on the downside under the prior administration. We're hoping that uh, things will change. Uh, this is a country that has always been uh, welcoming of um, people who are uh, persecuted in the countries, right? So we're hoping that this conversation today will provide some relevant conversations or re relevant information about what we can do um, individually and collectively to meet the needs of this uh, population. So let's move on to uh, the next slide, Rene. Uh, quickly before we uh, dive into the topic, uh, a quick uh, overview of the inclusive network. Uh, many of you on the call are members of ours. Uh, we are really grateful of, of that. Uh, we have grown tremendously over the last um, couple of years. We have now 452 members, uh, uh, collective assets of almost 250 billion, serving over 17 million people. So this is a growing network. It's a um, um, big network now, and we are really proud of that and, and really happy to be um, able to work with you all uh, in you know, promoting financial inclusion and community development throughout the country. Moving on to the next slide is, uh, of course, a reminder that uh, hopefully we'll see you in Puerto Rico. We have our first uh, in-person conference after two years in San Juan. Uh, we have an amazing lineup of speakers, so we're hoping that you'll be able to come. Well, there's a, a, a very strong protocol around uh, the pandemic, right, and how we make sure that, uh, that you, you will be protected um, against any issues, uh, but we are really happy that um, you know, the trends are going downward significantly. So it's gonna be a real celebration and we hope to see you there. These are some of the speakers that we're gonna have. Uh, and of course, you know, two things, you know, the, the main uh, hotel, the El San Juan Hotel, where we're hosting the conference is sold out, but we have two more hotels that uh, are offering um, discounts. The discounts actually, uh, were extended to April 18, so there's still time for you guys to uh, register and, of course, you know, find uh, um, hotel rooms uh, at the rate that is affordable. 
Um, quickly, juntos avanzamos program update. I'm gonna ask Rene actually to walk you all through where we are with juntos. Sure, thank you, Pablo. So as of today, the Juntos Avanzamos Network has 123 participating credit unions. We recently added two new members in the month of January, and we'll let you know who they are in a couple of minutes. Now, those 123 credit unions um, serve 9.6 million consumers in 145 branches throughout the country. Now, recently, um, inclusive and also Juntos Avanzamos celebrated two round tables at the GAC. It was great to see everyone and I'm sure many of those that are joining us in this webinar were also at the GAC, GAC and participated um, in our round tables. Pablo, if you could talk quickly about the CDFI round table. Yeah, yeah. We have uh, Senator Warner who has been one of the champions of CDFIs. Um, he was in our conference last, last year. Um, it was a virtual conference. Uh, the Senator has been a huge uh, supporter of CDFIs in general, <clears throat> but specifically of the work that uh, CDFI credit unions do. So we had a full house, as you can see. And it was a really fascinating conversation around the future of the CDFI movement. Right. And of course, we also had a Juntos Avanzamos roundtable. It was our fifth um, Juntos Avanzamos roundtable at the GAC. And we had a very interesting agenda. We had two panels. One of them um, was about uh, financial inclusion and serving the Hispanic market. And that included Samira Salem, the VP of DEI at CUNA, it also included um, Miguel Polanco, the director of, of the uh, Office of Minor okay, University. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting name. I, <laughs> I know, normally know the acronyms. And it was moderated by our, our trusted partner, Victor Corro at Copera Consulting. We then also had a panel around item lending and the transformational procedures that credit unions should go through when they offer item loans. And we had uh, Steve Pagenstasher, who you will hear from later on in this panel, talking about their transformational process at Point West Credit Union, and also Megan Schneider from Unitas Credit Union. And finally, as part of this um, roundtable, we um, gave an award that honored um, J. Kevin Ryan from Financial Center First Credit Union in Indianapolis, Indiana for his distinguished service to Hispanics in the state. And maybe Paolo, you can talk a bit more um, about Jay Kevin and his contributions during his tenure at Financial Center First. Yeah, really quickly, Ryan Kevin uh, has been um, or was uh, um, an innovator in the space of serving the Hispanic market. Uh, his credit union is located in Indianapolis. And back to 2003, I want to say, they started one of the first formal uh, collaborations with the Mexican consulate in that city. Uh, that collaboration was so um, effective, actually, that the Canadian made a commitment to open a mini branch uh, right next to the Mexican consulate, and that created huge synergies around collaborations between credit unions and the Mexican consulate network and basically became a blueprint for what would happen in the future. Um, many years later, we saw these partnerships popping up everywhere ac across the country and, and in many ways kind of uh, lay the ground for the work that we have been doing between the Juntos Avanzamos network and then and the network of Mexican consulates across the country. So very um, um, committed uh, leader in Indiana and someone who retired actually just a couple of months ago. So it was a well-deserved recognition for him. It was indeed. And this is the first Juntos Avanzamos award of this nature that we have given to members of our network. And we do hope to make this a permanent feature of the Juntos Avanzamos program and to announce the awards at the Juntos Avanzamos Roundtable at the GAC. And so just quickly in 2021, we welcomed the following credit unions to Juntos Avanzamos, a total of 13, pretty much scattered throughout the country. Many of them are on this call. So thank you so much for applying 
and joining the Juntos Avanzamos Network. And of course, the early earlier this year, we welcomed two new credit unions to Juntos Avanzamos, El Paso Area Teachers Federal Credit Union in El Paso, Texas, and Wauna Credit Union in Katskani, Oregon. Welcome as well. And having said that, we're moving on to the main event, our Serving Refugee Communities webinar with our great panelists. Pablo, on to you. Thank you, Rene. So we have an amazing lineup of um, panelists. Um, um, Mary Beth um, Wilkinson from um, Lutherans and Immigration, Immigration and Refugee Services, an organization that we have a tremendous amount of respect for. We've worked with them for many years. Um, they really specialize on helping immigrants and refugees, right, uh, in terms of um, integrating into the US, uh, in, into local economies. There's a huge um, implications around connecting this community to financial institutions. And that's where the rest of these panelists come into play. Uh, Carol Wright from Holy Rosary Trade Union, uh, an amazing friend, someone who's been working in, in this space for many, many years in Kansas City. Steve Pagenster from Point West Credit Union in Oregon, also a big friend, uh, someone incredibly committed to uh, immigrant communities and of course to the refugee population in Oregon, and Christina Sauve, who's been also a leader in this space for many years uh, from Cooperative Federal in uh, upstate New York. Uh, so we have this amazing collective um, knowledge here. We're going to start with Mary Beth first, and then we'll continue with the rest of the speakers. So Mary Beth, um, please talk to, to us about uh, your organization and, and hear the, I guess, the challenge and also the opportunity of serving these communities. Well, Pablo and Renee, thank you so much for that introduction. Let me share my screen. Um, let's see here, right? Okay. Um, are you able to see my screen okay? Yes. Yes, thank you. All right, well, I just wanted to start by saying um, a huge thank you to the Inclusive Network and the Juntos Avanzamos team for having me today to share on this panel. Um, also, if any of the listeners are celebrating Ramadan, Ramadan Kareem to you, um, I really feel it is a, a true honor to spend these minutes sharing about the work of Lutheran Immigration and Refugee Service, um, and most importantly, about our clients, refugee and immigrants, who are we are privileged to serve. Um, LIRS started in 1939, and these two pictures um, span the beginning of our work into our current work. The black and white photo on the left is of displaced German and Eastern European people that we first served. And the photo on the right is of an Afghan family uh, representing the Afghan evacuation that began last summer and is occurring into the present day. So first of all, what is LIRS? LIRS is one of the nine national refugee resettlement agencies in the United States. And since our beginning in 1939, we have welcomed over half a million individuals to this country. Um, something that LIRS considers to be a cornerstone of our work is what we call the long welcome. Now, what does that mean? The long welcome means we are helping clients not just to arrive to the United States and to meet basic survival needs, which is important, of course, but we want to establish programming and build partnerships that will help our clients truly integrate into the United States and to be able to use their skills, their knowledge, their insights, to contribute to their own personal success, as well as, as well as the success of our society. So as a snapshot of our recent work um, in response to the Afghan emergency evacuation, we resettled across our network almost 11,000 people between August of 2021 and February of this year. So in about six months, we resettled more people than we had resettled in the previous three years. Um, so we've been quite busy. Um, we will continue to welcome Afghans this spring and summer, as well as families from different parts of the world, including Ukraine. 
So you can see on your screen um, some different types of programming that LIRS runs. There's initial resettlement, which is a three month or 90 day program when we help refugees um, from the first day they arrive by plane in the US, we're helping them locate housing, food, clothing, transportation, and then introducing them to their new community. And then introducing them to the financial services and institutions in their community is a key component of this program. Next, we have fast-tracked employment um, we often call this the matching grant program. This program lasts for eight months and it helps refugees and immigrants find their first job in the United States, as well as providing some case management services. Career advancement is something that LIRS has been focusing a lot of energy on in the past three years. And we were very excited to launch our New American Cities program, which empowers clients to achieve career advancement. Um, this is done through job placements, networking connections, and then coalition building with city governments and other leaders who can advance a culture of welcome and opportunity for our clients. Last but not least, we have a strong and rapidly expanding programming uh, for unaccompanied children. And this is divided into two main branches, family reunification, as well as foster care services. We're headquartered in Baltimore, Maryland, and we operate through partnerships with nonprofit agencies across the nation. We provide supervision, funding and grant management, training and monitoring. Currently we are in 44 cities that represent 26 states. The number of partnerships over the past year has dramatically increased. Um, for example, the program that I'm a part of, Matching Grant, has gone from 24 sites to 42 in the past six months. And we anticipate that these numbers will only increase in the next 12 months. So on your screen, you'll see a list of our partner locations, um, the state, is at the top and underneath is the city where we have a partner in that particular state. Um, in fact, this list should be even longer um, because it doesn't fully represent all of our family and children's services program locations. Um, however, this department is going through rapid expansion um, and I wasn't able to obtain the most up-to-date list. So I'm happy to provide uh, this list to the Inclusive Network if that's helpful. And if you're in a location and you don't see an LIRS partner in your area, please feel free to reach out to me. There may actually be an LIRS affiliate close to you or um, a partner of another resettlement headquarters. And we would be glad to facilitate an introduction if that's helpful. So as we serve our clients, we often are talking to them about what they hope to do what their dreams and goals are, both in the present, the short-term goal, and the future, long-term goals. Um, some of the common goals we see is I want to buy a car, I want to be a homeowner, I want to start or further my education, I want to ensure that my children have the opportunity for a really good education. Um, this is a cornerstone value of um, a lot of our Afghan clients that we've been resettling. Also another major goal that we often hear is starting a business. So as you can see, all of these goals have a clear financial component. Um, now, how to get to those goals. Things that I would wanna emphasize are financial education, access to credit, and then finding a local financial home. These are key needs for our clients so that they can achieve their short-term and long-term goals. And when you think of partnering with LARS affiliates, here are a couple uh, promising practices I would encourage you to keep in mind. There are so many opportunities to braid financial services that you're providing into existing LIRS programs. All LIRS sites have employment programs and job readiness classes that could incorporate financial literacy workshops. Most sites have cultural orientation and ESL classes. So coming as a guest speaker or coordinating a field trip would be a great way to connect to clients. Affiliates are receiving a diversity of clients with a wide range of backgrounds. So it's important to be open to the variety of experiences, languages, and cultures that these clients are bringing with them. Um, one thing um, particularly to note is a lot of our Muslim clients may be coming um, and looking for REBA free or interest-free loans. 
Lastly, LIRS affiliates may not know that you're in their communities yet, so please reach out to them. And if there's not an LIRS affiliate in your city, like I said before, there might be another refugee resettlement agency working in your community that could benefit from working with you. As we all know, financial exclusion causes and perpetuates wealth disparities between native born and immigrant families. While the refugee median income increases over time in the US, it remains at least $3,000 lower than other immigrants and at least $8,000 lower than native born residents. And these are pre-COVID numbers. LIRS affiliates have refugee and asylee clients in need of your financial services. These affiliates can offer some initial language support and serve as a cultural bridge as you develop a partnership between refugee and immigrant clients. So if you're watching or listening and you'd like to partner with an LIRS affiliate or simply get more information, I would just encourage you to please reach out to me. Um, I'd be glad to facilitate, uh, facilitate a connection or find some information for you. Um, again, if there's not an LIRS affiliate in your location, I'd be glad to try and connect you to um, another resettlement headquarters that does have a presence in your community. So on your screen is my um, name, contact information by email and by phone. Please don't hesitate to reach out. And then I just wanted to close with um, a quote. Clement Clementine Waimuraya is a writer and an activist who personally experienced the horrors of the Rwandan genocide as a child. For many years, she lived in refugee camps with her sister before coming to the United States, um, Chicago, to resettle. And she says, there are millions of people, refugees, who have experienced the same conflicts and struggles I did. They have the same potential to defy the odds and achieve great things. So LIRS is seeking to help these people of potential not just survive, but thrive, to find opportunities for healing, for flourishing, for their children and their grandchildren. And we need partners like the Inclusive Network to make this happen. We're so excited and thankful that Juntos Amazamos is committed to relevant and accessible financial services and cultural awareness. You all have essential financial knowledge and training capabilities that our affiliates simply don't have on staff. So overcoming barriers to economic stability and mobility is essential to refugee integration and the LIRS commitment to the long welcome. So thank you for listening to me and thank you for the important work that you're doing each and every day. And I'll turn it back to you, Pablo. Thank you so much, Mary Beth. Um, this is, you know, we always learn more about the important work that you guys do. Um, you mentioned a couple of things. Uh, you have a network, we have a network. I think that the, the key here is to make sure that we facilitate those connections on the ground. Uh, serving these communities are like, you know, different uh, type of uh, expertise and capacity and credit unions that are committed to this market have, you know, a piece of, of the puzzle. You guys have another piece of the puzzle. So I think that together we can make a much bigger impact. So we'll definitely follow up on, on finding ways that we can uh, facilitate those connections more effectively and more rapidly because there's a clear need, you know, so hopefully we can do that over the next couple of months. Uh, two more things. Um, I think that there is um, some confusion when people uh, think of refugees. Um, there's, you know, these ideas about documentation barriers. Um, could you just speak to that quickly? When someone comes through this country as a refugee, what is the process in terms of, you know, due diligence? You know, do we know who these people are? Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, so if you're coming as a refugee into this country, you have gone through a host of screenings um, and uh, documentation checks. And so you are issued um, an I-94, which is giving you legal status upon entry into the United States. Um, you're also granted um, work authorization um, and you are given a pathway to citizenship you are um, able to apply for um, your green card within a year of arrival, and then um, uh, be, apply for citizenship five years after that. 
Thank you, Mary Beth. So yes, to clarify, right? It's because sometimes there's these, you know, ideas about how do we, you know, make sure that you know people's identity um, is verified. Then you have done all that uh, legwork already. So this is a much easier um, population to serve because a lot of that heavy work, you know, heavy lift has been done already by um, our partner here. So something for everyone to keep in mind. So let's, let's um, we're gonna have a, a Q and A later, but let's move on to, and thank you again, Mary Beth, uh, to Cristina Sauve from, um, um, oh my God, uh, Cobre de Federal in Syracuse. Um, Cristina, you have been doing this work for a very long time. And it's always been fascinating to me because I worked in New York City and I feel like you are the, the real expert when it comes to refugees. And it's like, what's going on here? What, what's going on in Syracuse that this is such an important part of your market? Yeah, well, thank you, Pablo. I appreciate your kind words. Um, it's really important to us, uh, the work that we do in terms of serving refugees and immigrants. And so I'll just start by telling you a little bit about us, and I think that'll help um, maybe clarify why this has become such a part of what we do. So Cooperative Federal has been working for Finance for the People since 1982. We have a very explicit mission to build the local economy in ways that foster justice, serve people in communities that are underserved by mainstream financial institutions, and responsibly manage our members' collective assets. And um, we have a very grassroots approach. We have four generally very small offices in neighborhoods that are underserved by banks, including an office at our Syracuse Housing Authority administrative building, which is right near um, a couple of different Syracuse Housing Authority complexes. We have multilingual staff and service. Uh, we did get our Juntos Avanzamos designation a number of years ago, and I will say our most developed, I think, continuum of services and service providers is definitely in, sp in the Spanish language. And that's in terms of our membership, at least 25% of our members prefer to do their business in Spanish. Um, but we also have staff and service um, in Somali, Swahili, Arabic, French, Lingala, Nepali, and Hindi. Our members hail from over 80 countries and speak at least 50 languages. Uh, Syracuse is a refugee resettlement city, so I'll talk a little bit more about that, and, and that is why we have, you know, the numbers that you're seeing there. In terms of what we do, we're a small credit union. Uh, we're under 35 million in assets, um, but we've lent out over $170 million to our members since 1982, and over 100% of our members' money stays invested locally. We leverage non-member deposits, often through the BEA program or from foundations or other institutions that want to support us uh, to be able to meet our members' loan demand. Oh, sorry, we just there. Uh, we really do focus on serving the underserved. Uh, and that shows up all across the spectrum of services that we provide. So for example, uh, we work a lot with first time home buyers, particularly low to moderate income people. 67% of our purchase mortgages are for first time home buyers. Minority and women owned businesses uh, comprise 64% of our, the business loans we've originated. 60% of our new members would be considered credit invisible um, or have who have a uh, low, low debt scores. Over 94% of our recent borrowers are from low-income households and membership's majority people of color. We also have a really explicit focus on socially conscious banking and we really embrace collaboration and partnership. Um, we cannot do this work alone and indeed with the refugee and immigrant work that we do, we work really closely with a number of community partners. And we also really pride ourselves on having a very diverse workforce. I mentioned that Syracuse and Onondaga County are part of the US Refugee Resettlement Program uh, with 40 plus year history of resettlement. The current most frequent resettlement for our areas from the Democratic Republic of the Congo, Sudan, Myanmar, Bhutan, 
Syria, Iraq, and Afghanistan. And the county executive and our, our city mayor did issue a letter and a statement explicitly welcoming Ukrainian ref refugees to Syracuse. Syracuse actually has a large number of Ukrainian immigrants and refugees already. Uh, we were also, our credit union in particular, was really impacted by the Cuban Entrant and Family Reunification Program. Um, and a number of our members are Cuban and a number of our staff as well. Uh, in terms of specialized services that we've offered and developed, um, I will say, I think just given the nature of our credit union and the people that we serve, the services that we've did that we have are designed to be explicitly accessible to people, including refugees and immigrants all across the spectrum. We do personal financial service, small business services, really that micro lending with smaller average loan sizes of under twenty thousand uh, dollars, and home ownership services and really comprehensive financial education. We do have credit builder loans. 40% of our new members have no score at all. 20% have a score under 600 in terms of their credit score. So we do have credit builder loans as well as payday alternative loans and lines of credit. Um, one example <coughs> of a uh, loan fund that we developed was with one of our local refugee resettlement uh, agencies, Interfaith Works, which operates their center uh, for new Americans. Uh, they developed a small loan fund that's particularly uh, for folks who are looking to get a driver's license. So this is for driver's license education, test fees, um, or for work credentialing. So getting uh, prior uh, credentials from you know, their country where they previously were to transfer over to the United States or for other work credentials. These are very small loan funds um, that we were able to operate with them. Um, so it's just one example with relaxed criteria. Um, the way that we were able to do this is they provide some loan loss reserves. Um, so that way, you know, we're still, of course, making sure that these loans are going to be able to be repaid, right? That there's an ability to repay component there, but that we're not going to necessarily worry, um, you know, about the uh, lack of credit history, the complete lack of credit history, uh, usually on, on uh, behalf of them. Uh, we also have an opportunity auto lending program. So this is a workforce development specific auto lending program. This serves um, anyone who is in a workforce development program in, uh, in Syracuse that's with one of our partners, Center State CEO. Um, and <coughs> This is also another program we've been able to do to develop with some backstop, some loan loss reserves. So the average credit score of a borrower in this, in this program has been under 600. Um, but as you can imagine, especially now as the cost of uh, transportation has increased, um, and in Syracuse, where public transportation is not necessarily a great way to get to a job, especially if we have folks who are working off shifts um, and outside of the city, um, having that auto for um, to get to a job is is so critical um, and a lot of what we're seeing is a lot of folks uh, falling prey to uh, buy here pay here places and getting poor quality vehicles um, or really high interest rates um, so that's another partnership that we've developed um, we are a hud housing counseling agency and we're also a financial empowerment center partner. So the city of Syracuse is a financial empowerment center city. Um, and uh, we are one of the locations for those counselors. One of our staff members is a counselor there. This provides free professional counseling to anyone who lives in the city of Syracuse. And um, we actually just uh, had one of our member service representatives who spoke four languages um, not, I took, I took all of his languages off of our slide there. He spoke a, additional languages um, who moved over there. And so he's very excited about being able to continue to serve the members that he started developing a relationship with at the credit union um, more broadly uh, as a counselor, right? So uh, sometimes that means lose staff to our partners 
uh, but sometimes, you know, we, we work with uh, the refugee resettlement agencies. We send our job listings when we do have openings to, to um, hopefully get some referrals over. And we, it's a net gain for the community, right? So he's, he's still out there doing really wonderful work in the community around financial access and inclusion. We also uh, offer individual development accounts through another partner organization. This is not a designated refugee resettlement agency. There are two in our area. One is Interfaith Works, another is Catholic Charities. Um, but this is uh, an agency called RISE, Refugee and Immigrant Self-Empowerment. This is just an agency that has sprung up that is directed and led by folks who came to Syracuse as refugees. Um, there are other agencies, of course, that have sprung up community and neighborhood learning centers uh, as well. Uh, so they received an Office of Your Refugee Resettlement Individual Development Account uh, grant, and we are their financial partner. So folks can come into open accounts, um, and we have worked out a process with them. We developed some financial education, some we've delivered directly, some is trained the trainer. Um, especially to folks who are community leaders or to make sure that we can cover the various languages that we need to be able to, right, to serve folks. So instead of us delivering all of the financial education, we have done a number of train the trainer sessions as well. Um, and <clears throat> we also uh, have developed a process um, with them for uh, when the matches are, are made and when folks can withdraw their funds and, and how, that, how that works. So if anyone's not familiar with individual development accounts, take a quick step back here. These are specific asset uh, building accounts. Um, often what will happen is folks are saving for one of maybe three or four purposes to uh, start a business, buy a home, purchase a car to get to school or to work, or for education purposes. Um, and their savings are matched. So if someone saves $2,000, they receive a matching grant of another $2,000. There's a financial education component that goes along with this that's specific to that asset. So maybe it's education around buying a car or education uh, you know, around buying a home. Uh, just a quick, case study example here of some of the work that we've done. Uh, this is a couple of our members, Eduardo and Kenya, and their kids. Uh, they arrived in Syracuse from Cuba um, as winter was approaching, and they needed a car. They were pretty worried about driving in Syracuse in the winter, understandably. Uh, we get a, a lot of snow. Um, and that would be their first experience. So they felt they needed an SUV and they needed one quickly. They did a personal uh, car purchase and the vehicle turned out to need a transmission uh, pretty much immediately. Uh, so they didn't have a whole lot of recourse given that this was an uh, individual to individual sale. We were able to help them with a personal loan to get their car repaired. We also had them join our uh, credit builder club uh, pretty much uh, immediately so they could get started working on building credit and to qualify for even better interest rates. I didn't mention this on here, but we do, we do risk-based pricing, but we also specifically advertise to members who come back to us as you build your credit score, as you improve your credit score, and we'll um, decrease your interest rate on your existing loan. Some operations and other considerations, if you are looking to get into serving refugees and immigrants more, uh, community partnerships are absolutely key. Um, there will be folks who have been doing this work in your communities on the ground for years, who are really plugged into the needs uh, of your community. Um, so absolutely develop those partnerships. Um, one operational partnership we developed actually was some special check cashing arrangements. So when uh, refugees are first arriving into the country, there may be a first check that they're receiving so they can handle all of those initial urgent needs um, and people need a place to cash that check. So we developed a partnership with Interfaith Works um, for an exception to our usual third party or non-member, not third party, but excuse me, non-member check cashing. So we usually have limits on the non-member check cashing that we do, but we have an exception here 
and we did some explicit education or staff around what that I-94 would look like. So what kind of documentation would people have when they very first arrived within the first few days um, so that they can get access to these funds. Um, <clears throat> account opening. Um, so consider the identification documents you will accept with account opening. We do account opening with or without a social security number. People are not required to have a social security number. They're required to have a government issued United States or other identification number, right? So that's very firmly um, our stance and our approach, but I think each credit union needs to decide for themselves how they will approach this. And then make sure to train staff because asking questions, you know, we do need to ask questions as, as we all know, as part of our member due diligence, but we also want to be thoughtful around the questions we're asking to folks as they come in to join us to ensure that they feel welcome and, and that they are safe becoming a member with us. Uh, we do ITIN lending and Inclusive has done whole sessions on these. So I would highly recommend checking um, those out and looking to Inclusive for more resources there. Um, there's also a lot of considerations to be done around your communications, your website, your home banking, um, you know, uh, newsletters, anything else like that, uh, incoming phone calls. And um, this is something that I don't think we really have down to a science yet, but you know, how will you handle that in the languages that uh, your members speak and they, the people that you're serving? And also consider incentive pay for people who speak, uh, who are fluently uh, bilingual or multilingual. Um, that's something that we've adopted fairly recently after hearing about it several times, um, you know, during Juntos Avanzamos sessions um, that we thought was an important equity consideration. And that's what I have for you today. Thank you again for having me on here. I really appreciate it. Oh, thank you so much, Christina. Uh, you said that you're a small credit union, but you certainly are determined and are making a huge impact. So thank you for your commitment. It's really um, something to be recognized. Two things about uh, your points. You really like the fact that, that you emphasize the power of partnerships. Um, in this work, uh, I think that that's the, the whole concept here where you know the financial institution knows what we know about financial services. You know, we need somebody else who can guide us in terms of you know being that cultural bridge or bringing some of the resources that agencies in your community may be able to provide. And also that expertise about connecting with this community. So thank you for emphasizing that. And then the second point is you know the importance of having bilingual or multilingual staff and, and the importance of recognizing that, 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 that there's a value to that, that, that should be you know, monetized some, somehow because it's a skill. Um, so thank you for mentioning that. Um, we have a number of questions already on, in the chat, but we're gonna move on now to um, Carol Wright from Holy Rosary Credit Union, Hello, um, Carol. Okay, so now it's your turn to uh, share with us, you know, what you, the amazing work that you guys are doing in your community. And again, you are such an amazing leader in this space. So here to learn from you. Thank you so much, Pablo, for the introduction and the opportunity to be here today. I'm so grateful to Inclusive for their support on the pathway that Holy Rosary has been on. And I'm so grateful to be a member of, and I'm gonna say it in English, because even though Santa gave me Rosetta Stone for Christmas, I would massacre the pronunciation. Together we advance. Aren't those beautiful words? I think those words are good enough to start a, an entire credit union movement on. Isn't that what we do? Holy, at Holy Rosary, the mission drives everything we do. People trust us because they know that we're mission driven over profit driven. It doesn't mean that we don't look at the numbers when we introduce a new product. It doesn't mean that we don't have to incorporate financial responsibility at all times, but it's all about the purpose. 
When I came to Holy Rosary in 2008, I was very excited because I read a trade association newsletter that called us. It was a newspaper actually back then in 2008 when they actually made magazines. And they called us the Melting Pot Credit Union. And I couldn't think of any better nickname to be known as. The Credit Union was founded in 1943 by Italian immigrants. And when I talked to my chair, who since passed away, he told me of the trauma and that they had been through as immigrants and why they wanted to open their doors to the Vietnamese. And so that was the next step. We serve about 89% low income members. We got our first CDFI certification in 2012. We have four branches, two of which are in social service centers and don't cost us money. Um, they actually help provide the staff for those social service set centers. And I stand to say, Currently, we only speak three languages at Holy Rosary, um, but with our new website, we will be incorporating Weglots, weg and we will also be adding a translation service at the same time so that we can serve any language that comes in the door. But wait, did we really deserve our nickname? On paper, when I arrived, the credit union had four parishes in their field of membership. One was, one was Italian Catholic, one was Vietnamese Catholic, and the other two were Hispanic. And when I asked how many newsletters we should send to those parishes, the retiring president said, oh, we don't work with those people. And I thought to myself, we do now. Even, even more, I knew we were bordering on the edge of the Black American community of the city, and I didn't see enough members in that group of people. Thankfully, the new president, I mean, the new, the remaining board agreed with me, and not the retiring board, uh, the retiring president, and the work began. But I have to tell you that I saw Winona Nava's name on the chat. And back when I was trying to get ready for the board meeting where I was going to introduce serving additional immigrant populations, I made a call to Winona Nava, and she was so helpful. She said, Carol, you just work with them. You just, you just serve them and help them, help them. And that's what I would recommend to anybody who is going into the business. So fast forward here. And we've grown in assets. This is since 2010, not since 2008. If we were going to look back to 2008, it would be even different. But 2008 to nine, we had started on the road to um, making the credit union more accessible electronically. We had no online banking, no website, no electronic services, all paper-based lending. And so why we've been trying to add these new paper-based um, I mean, these new immigrant groups, we've been working with that issue too. You can see our assets have grown 284%. But let me tell you, it's not about size. It's not about growth. It's about making the difference in the lives of each and every member we serve. Our strategic plan calls for us to be 89 million by the time I retire. Since I'm old, that's not too far away. Um, but our loans have gone up 348%. We, our membership growth has gone up 120%. When, if I was going to look at this number right here with membership growth in 2008, when I came into the credit union, they had a negative membership growth and, and they had for several years. Um, and we'd already started to make to make advances on that membership growth here. Where did we where did we start adding immigrant groups? And I went back to to look at the record, and it was over a period of a year or two. So it it was actually a better result than it shows here. Um, you can see our, our our delinquencies gone down. 
our ROA, we actually made $220 this year where it says zero, but you can see that we're doing better now. Equity capital is the only number that's going the wrong direction. And that actually is going up again as our loan to share ratio goes up. But we've more than um, tripled in size. We're almost tripled the size. And so you can expect that the equity capital ratio would go down. We have, as I already said, we have four branches. When I came, we had four staff meeting. The staff members, two spoke Vietnamese, two spoke English. We have 19 now, and we only have Spanish, Vietnamese, and English, but plans are on, on the drawing board to add more. How did we transition? How did we move? We had no money. You saw that ROA of zero, actually $220 net income. A, we, we really didn't have any resources to expand. But you can see this word in italic, these words in italics here, and it's back to the last presentation where we talked about where partnerships was constantly men mentioned. The key to working with new immigrant groups is partnerships. So I got a, a small little NCUA grant to hire Nancy Heroes to do a focus session and a, a business plan for our development. And Brother Jim, a local St. Anthony's parish, asked eight couples who were influential in the parish to come to the focus session and come to the seven week financial education class. The seven week financial education class was also taught by NCUA, I mean, funded by NCUA. It was very labor intensive. We taught it about four or five times. And each time we provided dinner, babysitting, and the class instruction. It's a phenomenal class. It was on helping immigrants adjust to this country. We are trying to do it in less expensive, less labor intensive ways now. But um, we're open to reversing that. We also got a small grant for an for a school branch from NCUA. And somebody from the credit union movement told me, Carol, you'll see those, the parents of those kids, you'll see them come join your credit union. And I thought they were a little overzealous, a little optimistic. But I was working on a grant report in the middle of the night and I'm looking up the names of the school branch kids and their addresses. And I'm looking up our new Hispanic uh, Latino population that we'd added, and the addresses are the same, and the names are the same, and the kids have brought their parents in. Um, we had no one at the branch who spoke Spanish, so we got an NCUA grant for, I think it was $4,000, and we got a, a young lady who spoke Spanish, and we'd stationed her at the teller counter when the hours were the busiest. And we spread that over the time until we could afford to hire somebody. When we did hire, we'd hired people from the community. And I can't stress that enough. Um, our people know the stories of immigration. They know the pain of immigration. And recently, one of my staff members wrote a big poster to put along the credit union wall that essentially was said something to the effect of serve these people like they're members of your family. Pretend like it's your dad and your mom. And that is, that is the way my people do serve my people. And we followed guidelines that we got from the experts, like inclusive. They have a great webinar that I went to one time and I kept the PowerPoint slides from it that talks about the different things that you can do to better serve immigrant population. We did have targeted products. These products, they're different. Everybody has Visa credit cards, but they're not like our credit cards. Every product that's on here was designed to serve the need of the people we sat across the desk from and, and felt their agony and their pain and their roadblocks. We changed the services we offer and the construction of the services we offer to help them be successful. 
for the ones that are in green, we specifically trans, um, changed a little bit to serve the Latino population. For instance, international remittances, they're key. And we, right now, we use mostly Bed Global ACH. It is not the fastest way to send money, but I understand you get the highest return rate if you can wait the day to say to send the money. We have a debit card program that we modeled after Latino that um, we need to get back to and streamline so that it could serve the needs of, of the, the people a little better. The mortgage loans. Most of our, a lot of our uh, Latino population does not have ITIN numbers. And that, I mean, does not have um, social security numbers, so they use ITIN numbers instead. And we found that, well, even with the Vietnamese population, we found that conventional mortgages are sometimes hard for them to achieve. So we've adapted to a 5-5 arm product so that we can help the people who need the mortgage loan now at the lowest possible rate. And and it's on, built on a stable index so that um, so that they can have a payment they can afford no matter what happens. Down here is a pink one that isn't green. And what that is about is the next area that we're working. I'm writing a grant this afternoon when I get done with this webinar um, because our people need to build their small businesses to gain assets. So even though we're a small credit union, we're trying to do that. I was asked to talk about if there were any regulatory concerns. There absolutely, I never had any regulator raise any questions on anything that I've done. We started with a good um, Bank Secrecy Act policy that allowed us to open safe accounts for people with a government issued ID. It could be a, an ID from a foreign country, no problem there. I really want to get to the place where Holy Rosary can be in a stand in IRS ITIN distributor because that is so needed and it's so hard to get in our community. And so that's a long term goal. So thank you very much for the opportunity to be here today. Um, we will do anything we can to help any of you develop your program if you want to write me or ask any questions. So thank you for the opportunity to share today, Pablo. Thank you so much, Carol. Really appreciate it. I, I think that you made the case, you know, for the financial inclusion business case here. You know, this is something that is not just the right thing to do. This is something that is sustainable and even more than sustainable is something that, you know, uh, generates growth and relevance in the communities we serve. So thank you so much for that. Um, we're gonna move quickly to Steve uh, from Point West. You know, we have, we, we have technically two more minutes, but I would like to ask everyone on the call if they can stay a few more minutes. Uh, Steve has also amazing experience here in this space. And Steve, we so much appreciate your commitment and your leadership uh, serving the Hispanic community, but also the immigrant community. So without further ado, your turn, my friends. Well, thank you, Pablo. And uh, hello, everybody. Happy Monday. Uh, what a great way to start off the week. Uh, and wow, I mean, uh, three fantastic uh, presentations from three fantastic organizations, uh, and also all of them rocking PowerPoint. So good to you guys. For those who know me, uh, I am not a huge fan of PowerPoints. And, and frankly, after those three groups, there's so much that uh, they've already covered that I feel like, you know, I'll keep it as short and sweet as possible uh, for all of you. But for those who don't know who I am, I'm Steve Pagenstecker. I'm the Chief Innovation Officer at Point West Credit Union. Uh, we're based in Portland, Oregon. Uh, we are a CDFI, Juntos Avanzamos Credit Union, uh, been in CDFI certified since 2014. Got our Juntos Avanzamos in, was that 2016, Pablo? Yeah, 2016. Wow. Uh, first in the state of Oregon. Um, we really started our community development uh, outreach impact story uh, in 2004 when we merged with Hacienda Community Credit Union here in Portland. Um, through that process, we became a far more diverse organization. 
Uh, and since Hacienda had really been focused on serving uh, immigrant refugee uh, members, that was something that became a focus for Point West. Um, fast forward a couple of years, credit union almost didn't survive through the Great Recession. Uh, but when we came out the other side, it was really an opportunity for us to refocus on what we were going to do. Why were we here? Did we even have a purpose for existing anymore? Uh, and I'm happy to say that we do. So now we're a $115 million credit union uh, specifically focused on serving underserved populations, primarily immigrants and refugees. Uh, here in the state of Oregon, you know, one in 10 uh, people who live here are immigrants. One in nine are U.S. citizens that have an immigrant uh, family member. Uh, we have over 10,000 DACA recipients here in the state of Oregon. 13% of our workforce is made up by immigrants. So this is something that uh, makes a lot of sense for credit unions to pay attention to, which is why you guys are all on the call today. Uh, and it's something that's been really near and dear to us. And I just want to reiterate exactly what the other folks have said, which is uh, it's about having, about listening, right? And listening means a lot of things. Listening to uh, the constituents and the communities you're trying to reach and making sure that your products and services align, uh, giving the details right, which is making sure that your underwriting guidelines, that your processes, procedures, policies all align and ensure that you're building trust rather than taking trust away from those communities. Uh, and then finally, you know, make sure that it's, it's the right fit for your organization. Um, you know, not every organization is going to be, you know, right for Point West, it's the Hispanic community. That's the largest immigrant uh, community we have in the Portland metro area. Um, primarily Mexican immigrants is where we see a lot of, we do see some Somali, we do see some Eastern European, but for the most part, uh, we're, we're talking about immigrants from Mexico in the Portland metro area. That isn't going to be the case across the country, right? And so knowing your community and, and making a dedication for your organization from the top down to serve that community correctly uh, is really going to be, you know, whatever that, that community is, uh, identify it and make sure that you're providing the right resources. That means things like staffing. That means things like the products and services we talked about, uh, making sure that all your products and services are available and open to them. And then finally, like it's already been said numerous times, uh, building relationships within the community with the right community partners, the right culturally specific organizations is key. Uh, you will not build trust uh, and create lasting relationships with that community if you aren't working with organizations that already have that. Uh, and that means dedicating time and resources, uh, dedicating staff time, being involved in things that are important to those partners as well. Uh, and then you'll create these Kind of synergistic partnerships where you can build lending programs, uh, financial education programs uh, around things that are important to the, their clients and community as well as your membership and community. And I'll stop there and just say, uh, great way to start my week. Happy to be here. If anyone ever has questions, please reach out to me. These guys know how to get, get in touch with me. Thank you so much, Steve. Uh, you're right. Um, it's a great way to re-energize. This conversation is incredible. You know, the impact at the end of the day, you know, it's about how we can impact people and communities and all of you are doing that. And that's really our purpose, right? We can do this um, and we can do it well and, and we can do it in a way that is sustainable um, and it's helpful also to our members. So thank you so much for sharing uh, your experience serving refugee and immigrant communities. Uh, we do have a couple of questions, I think, Renee. Can we just uh, quickly address them? We do. We have a couple of questions. Some are being typed, some were answered actually by our panelists by typing in. One is by Simeon Chapin. I apologize if I completely mis, um, misread that. Um, and the question is, for credit unions that are working with refugees in the time before they receive the social, what documentation is being used to meet internal compliance for account opening? Now, Barry Beth already answered part of it and Carol signaled that she wanted, she wanted to answer this question live. So Carol, would you like to answer that question? Um, is the documentation that we use is government issued picture ID. It can be from Puerto Rico. I mean, it could be from El Salvador, from France, from any country, as long as it's government issued and it has a pictured ID. It should not be expired. 
Sometimes we will send people to the Mexican consulate, for instance, if they're from Mexico to get a new ID, but nobody has trouble coming up with it. Yeah, and that's something important to clarify uh, your mandate as a financial institution is to verify someone's identity and, and that where any government issued ID that is not expired should uh, meet that purpose. Uh, just really quick too, I just want to reiterate that, that I think we make a lot of assumptions because uh, we build our programs on what we've known and what people have told us, right? And I think BSA compliance and your member identification program are a place where you can spend a lot of time uh, simplifying things and really kind of revisiting uh, and working with experts who know, but oh, being able to expand the kinds of ID that you accept. A lot of folks, I talk to creatives all the time that are like, oh, we don't accept matricula cards. We don't accept other government photo ID that's current. Um, and I think that's built on the assumption that it has to be a, like a US passport or a state driver's license, right? Uh, and that's not the case. So uh, if that is of interest to anybody, I would highly recommend you spend some time looking at that and seeing if there's barriers that can be broken. Great. Excellent. Now the rest of the questions have really been answered by panelists in the chat or in the Q&A box. So Paolo, we do not have any additional questions. Well, with that, then can, can I ask everyone to turn their cameras on so we can take a picture of this amazing conversation today? Thanks again to the panelists and to everyone who participated through the chat. We're going to be sending this out, all these presentations, to everyone who's registered for this. But um, thanks again for sharing this information, panelists. Uh, I feel so energized, so motivated, you know. My heart is full right now. Thank you. All right. So, Randy, you're going to take a couple of pictures. I am doing that right now. Let's see uh, here. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Let's take another one, Paolo. You were looking down. One okay. again. Okay. <laughs> Three, two, one. Okay. All right, well, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Have thank a great you. day. Thank Bye. you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you for joining us. Have a great afternoon. Bye-bye.